It is the mark of a big empire to have a well-standardized and efficient monetary system, with plenty of different denominations to support a complex economy, multiple mints to supply its territory, and yet, a simple and straightforward relation between each coin has to make transactions straightforward. Not only that, it must have clear and easy to understand messages to all of its citizens as to who's in charge. Alexander's 10 years of campaigns brought to its conquered peoples the innovative and somewhat simple monetary system of the ancient Macedonians. Today, we're going to take a look at the coin denominations of one of history's biggest conquerors, Alexander the Great. It is really complicated to talk about denominations in ancient Greece and not have a video that would last a couple of hours, frankly. If you know something about ancient Greece is that, for most of antiquity, it was a region of fiercely independent city-states. And with independence comes the lack of standardization. An exception was what is called the Attic Standard, which is named after the region where Athens is located, Attica. Silver was king at this time, and the Attic Standard was based on a key base piece, which we already discussed, the drachma, weighing 4.3 grams of silver, with multiples and fractions that could go down to 0.09 grams per coin. But today we're not here to discuss Athens. One nation that adopted the Attic Standard that matters to our story were the Macedonians. As Alexander went into his campaigns and flooded the Hellenistic economy with vast amounts of metal from the now defunct Persian Empire, he had to adapt a monetary system that was designed to work with leagues of city-states at most to one that could work with an entire empire multiple times that size. He then instituted a fully trimetallic system, adopting gold as the main store of wealth, silver as the main body of precious metals to move the economy, and resolved the problem of minuscule silver denominations instituting a series of local municipal bronze coins which would serve as fractions of the drachma. His system would, in broad strokes, look like this. A new gold coin, called a stator, would be the big store of wealth. This coin would be valued at 20 drachma, or 5 tetradrachma. The drachma and the tetradrachma would be the main silver denominations. Some fractions and multiples would exist in silver, but the vast majority of coins minted would be of these two denominations in silver. And finally, once you entered the city and needed to do your daily expenses in the marketplace, spending a silver drachma for a small purchase would result in you getting a series of fractional bronze coins, instead of minuscule little silver pieces. In broad strokes, that was the system, a simple, straightforward set of denominations that could easily be controlled by the central authority and easily implemented by local authorities and mints as minting rights were delegated. So let's jump straight into the big boy in the game, the gold stator. If you consider a drachma to be the normal daily wage of a laborer, this coin of mere 8.5 grams and around 18 millimeters could pay someone for around 20 days. The concentration of wealth gold possesses was, and still is, tremendous. The obverse lacks any legends. It is just an elegant bust of Athena, with her crested Corinthian helmet and her hair flowing on her back. The Greek aesthetics on coinage shows a huge contrast to the later Roman coins, which take a lot of space and effort saying titles and passing as many messages as possible. The Greeks simply added a scene, as nicely crafted as possible, and let the visuals do the talking. The reverse offers us a little bit more complexity. We have Nike, the goddess of victory, carrying her typical laurel crown, and a stylus, a protective idol typically put on ships. On the right, we see the legends Alexandru, or of King Alexander, and take a look at this little liar to the left. You will see plenty of these random symbols on the coinage of Alexander. Each of the dozens of mints throughout his empire would have its own little symbol. This was a way of imperial administration to keep track of the circulation of coin metal and keep track of the quality of each mint. Now let's move to silver and the two main denominations that use this metal, the drachma and the tetradrachma. Both use the same design we've shown here on previous episodes. On one side, 
we have the head of, head of Hercules, wearing the skin of the Nemean lion as a headdress. And the reverse features Zeus, sitting on his throne, with an eagle and a staff. Just like the stator, both bear the inscriptions Alexandru, some also having the variety Basileos Alexandru, or of King Alexander. Now, why do I insist on showing these iconic pieces so many times? Basically because of their stylistic varieties. Depending on where the mint was located, not only would you find the different mint marks, but the entire style of the design could be different. In certain mints, Hercules will look almost pleased with himself, while in others, a fierce belligerent one would take his place. Let's take a closer look at these two coins. First, the Tetradrachma. At over 30 millimeters wide and nearly 17 grams, this coin was one serious chunk of silver. We see a well-centered bust of Hercules. The lovely thing about this tetradrachm is that it's like every other coin is a sculpture and it's hard to find the die match, so every other tetradrachm you come across should have its unique appearance. The reverse features Zeus with his legs crossed, which indicates Alexander had already passed away when this coin was minted at the city of Masembria. This drachma, on the other hand, shows a, shows a much more relaxed Hercules. A typical drachma will weigh around 4.3 grams and be around 17, 18 millimeters in diameter, just like this one. So let's look at the reverse, and it has a couple of interesting bits. The monogram to the left, which indicates the mint authority of the Miletus, and notice how very pronounced the flow lines are. These coins were heated up to a cherry red tone, making them as malleable as wet clay, so when the hammer blow quickly displaced the soft silver outwards, the marks of the flow of material were permanently etched to the coin's surface. The hotter the coin was, the more intense this effect is. Now this next coin is a lovely example of the bronze coinage that the Greeks used on their pocket change. As a curiosity, this particular piece was struck by Pyrrhus of Epirus, the same Pyrrhus that invaded Rome in 280 BC, over 50 years after Alexander's death. This shows that even the low denomination designs by Alexander lived long after his passing, just by how popular and widespread they were. On the obverse, we see the typical Macedonian phalanx shield, with the monogram of Pyrrhus's name on the center. The reverse features a Macedonian helmet, with the inscriptions ba Z of Basileus, the king, all within oak leaves on a wreath. Quite a complex design to what was essentially pocket change. Alexander's death meant his empire soon shattered into a myriad of other smaller empires, but since the system instituted by him served them so well, his successors simply kept the same monetary standard. But what is fantastic about them is how we see an explosion on the number of designs. Let's take a look at some of these later pieces, starting out by this coin that copies a design from Alexander's father, Philip II. On the obverse of this coin, struck around 323 BC, either by Philip III or Alexander IV, we can see the boost of Zeus, with his typical dense beard and a laurel wreath. The reverse features a young man riding a horse and holding a palm branch, with the legends translating to of King Philip, and a lovely dark patina over the silver surface. So how about we head to Pella, the home city of Alexander, where this coin was minted around 306 BC under Demetrios Poliorchites, son of one of Alexander's generals, Antigonus. Demetrius was among the first to have the courage to put his own face on coinage, something previously considered something of a sacrilege. On one side, we see the bust of Demetrius, wearing a headband that will become the typical symbol of Greek monarchs in the Hellenistic period. The reverse is stunning. Demetrius was known for his projection of power by the means of his powerful navy, 
and his coinage is well known for showing this projection of power through sea iconography. In this case, we see a rather muscular Poseidon, holding his trident and stepping over a rock. Fantastic sculpting job representing an anatomically correct physique. The legends translate to of King Demetrius, and the little monogram to the left of the field has the legends of the word Pella. Now, I have featured this kind of coin before in the channel, but it is inevitable not to show it again. I believe this is one of the most elegant and well-executed designs on any Hellenistic coin. The Kingdom of Thrace, under King Lysimachus, one of Alexander's bodyguards, wanted to honor Alexander after his passing, depicting his image on all silver coinage. This example, struck around 305 BC, features Alexander with the royal headband and the horns of Amon Zeus, symbolizing he was now a divinity. This big flan of 30 millimeters allows for the engraver to make a, quite a delicate bust of Alexander. And most examples of this type are of very nice craftsmanship. The reverse shows this marvelous image of Athena reclined on a chair, holding Nike in one hand and resting her hand on her shield and her spear. The mint mark is this curious little torch to Athena's left, and Nike is seen crown crowning Lysimachus' name. The legends, following the tradition of the time, translate to of King Lysimachus. The Hellenistic monetary standard and Alexander, as we can see, was much, much simpler than the chaos of denominations of the previous classical period. A clear order of equivalence and weight was established between gold, silver and bronze, allowing for simple and useful denominations to be struck in great quantities. What did not become standardized, fortunately, were the multitude of designs featured on the coins. Good for us, so we get to enjoy the many artistic expressions of so many different die engravers. Collecting a denomination set of Alexander the Great, fortunately, is not one of the hardest numismatic accomplishments, particularly if you skip the gold issues. And if you like any of the pieces depicted on today's episode, and is watching this episode before the 14th of February 2021, our sponsors at Savaka Coins will be having these coins up for auction at their 95th silver auction, as well as more than 800 of other high quality pieces. Their silver auctions are aimed at higher quality pieces, so it is a great opportunity to get yourself a rare or higher quality coin. So if you are interested, definitely check them out. And if you are watching this video after the auction date, don't worry, just head over to savaka-coins.com and take a look, as another auction should definitely be happening soon. So now let me hear you collectors, have you got any coins of Alexander the Great? Maybe a piece that used its monetary standard? Let us know in the comments what you think, and don't forget to like and subscribe, so we can keep bringing ancient coins to YouTube. I hope you all have a good time, stay safe, and see you soon.